on those who were our prologue. I just want to mention just one of many prologues. Um, uh, three months before um, my paternal grandmother um, is marched to the ovens of Auschwitz, she writes to my father in response to his question to her. His question to her is, Dear Mother, are you hungry? And her response is, Dear Son, I am not, but I will be the moment that I cannot share food with the person who comes to my door and tells me that he or she are hungry. That to me has always been a crucible moment. I can focus on the anger that I feel, the stench that I feel in my nostrils each morning I rise, or I can focus on what my mother would have wanted, or my grandmother would have wanted me to become if I were privileged enough to survive. I think she wanted me to be involved with those who are hungry, to share what I have and have been privileged to have with those who have not. And therefore, in my case, thanks to the memories left for me, I understand, believe it or not, why I could have been a terrorist. I can understand very clearly why Hamas is Hamas. I'm a Jew born in Tel Aviv, but I do understand terrorism. I do understand anger, and I understand the transformation possible to take your anger and to shape it into something worthwhile and healing. And I'm very privileged to be here today to learn more about how you've managed to heal and civilize the world. Thank you. Please. Nathan Rosenberg. Um, Warren shares uh, about his experiences in the military and at national laboratories, which Warren, I'm going to presume, were kind of crucible uh, experiences. And I, was, uh, I wanted to coattail on what the young man on the other side of the room was talking about. <clears throat> in the military, they manufacture crucible experiences many, many times during the development of, a, of an officer or a, a non-commissioned officer. Um, uh, Werner Earhart's here, and, and for many people, the S training and the forum were crucible experiences. Um, I went to a military academy. I took a class in leadership. I don't remember anything from the class in leadership, but I remember all those experiences, the real experiences I had. And I wanted to both ask the academics and the CEOs on the panel, should companies provide a crucible experience for their developing leaders? Should business schools or schools training government leaders provide something outside the classroom, something more than the classroom that, that does exactly what the professor talked about in terms of giving people that moment to actually confront themselves and who they're going to be in the matter as a leader? I don't know if I can answer that. One, one piece of the puzzle I would say is I don't believe you can teach anyone to lead, so don't, you know, I just want to say that clearly, and we tell the students that immediately. Uh, we can help them, help give them the tools they'll need to teach themselves how to lead, and that will involve learning how to capitalize on your, on, on your life experiences, not just your job experiences, but your broader life experiences. One of the things that worries me about your comment, though, is the classroom experience is an experience. And 
you should see it, I mean, as a professor, you build, hopefully, relationships among people in the classroom, and that is a real experience. It's not a laboratory or anything. Those are people you're interacting with and the people you're trying to get some serious work done. So I, I'm a little uncomfortable separating out, you know, nothing, you can't do anything in the classroom, or that, that's not, there, there are all kinds of things if you're really building relationships. Teaching is about relationship building amongst, between you and your students as individuals and collectively. So I do think of that very much as a place where, where we're growing up together and we're all trying to figure out what are the tools we need so we can continue to learn from each other because I think as Jim said, we're very social learners and we need each other to learn. And also, you know, how does, how does this sort of stance and the tone you set up there make people very curious about life and eager and feel supported to go out and learn from both positive and negative experiences. I know there's someone in the audience who's working on positive psychology. I mean, one of the pieces of the puzzle for me, and I don't want to get into a battle about what's a real crucible or what's not a real crucible. I mean, there are a range of them and I under, uh, uh, that you can have. But the other piece in the positive psychology movement, a part of that which I'm very intrigued about is this whole issue of the reflected best self. The idea that what, what that's about is we don't actually know when we're at our best. And so what the, a lot of professors at Michigan are working on is what if you gave feedback to people only about when they were at their best? Because leaders are very imperfect. They do certain things well and they're horrible at other things. But we don't know what really it means when we're at our best. I, and I happen to be ill and my colleagues wrote a book for me of one page stories of Linda at her best. And half of what they described were situations I didn't even recall. Right? I mean, which is very interesting, which is what this research shows. And then you look for the patterns of when do other people experience you in this mirror way as you being at your best. And so there are tools you can give to people, and I think we have now incorporate that into our classroom experience that we offer the first years, so they can see how other people perceive them. Because leadership is about matching intent and impact. But if you don't understand deeply, and because these stories are very grounded and they have to tell an incident when they experience you at your best, I now know from 35 people when they think I'm at my best. And when I, and it, there's some, it really is, it's very difficult to read the stories, frankly, in some ways, because you never get totally positive feedback like that. But the themes, and then how I actually use that when I'm at my best, and it also, what's not there tells me when I'm not at my best in a way, but I wasn't really focused on that, it's very positive. Then how do I use that information that I now have, which is so precious, and do serious things with it? So please don't separate out the classroom in the way you did because I couldn't do what I do if, <laughs> if I have to think that students, I know they do it and we, we really need to try to think about life as an experience, school as an experience, it's real and using it as a tool to help us all develop collectively. Howard, then Joe, then Tom. Excuse, excuse me, Howard Gardner. Um, I think the conversation's been uh, very f wide ranging, which is good, but it may also be somewhat wandering and uh, I'm going to try to uh, do a little disaggregating, which I hope will be helpful. Um, first of all, everybody has crucible experiences, capital C or little c, because you know, we all are somebody and it has to come from somewhere. And we will reflect in our lives to try to identify these experiences. And in a sense, uh, it almost doesn't matter how real or how faux they are to others as long as to us they help us explain how we got to be where we are. That's not the same as crucible experiences for being a leader. And I would suggest that there probably would be at least three things we'd want to look for in trying to understand and train leaders. The first thing is what kind of experiences would make somebody think, gee, I'm a leader, because nobody's born. And we're all born egocentric, but we're not born uh, thinking that we can uh, you know, have influence in lots of other people. Um, a second one is, given that I have some capacity or at least some potential to lead, what are the important things, what are the missions that I have? Gandhi is, of course, a, you know, a total, total example of that because uh, knowing, knowing that you have a, have a leadership inclination is very different from knowing what your program is. And then I, th I think the third thing, which I haven't heard enough about today, is given that you want to lead and, and given you, uh, that you have a, a mission or program, how can you be effective? How can you achieve what you want? And here's where I think the failures are very, very important. It's when, you know, you yell at people and nothing happens. Um, <laughs> you, know, you, 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 
you issue an edict and the people do the opposite, that's when the crucible really works or doesn't work and you shift from being a potential person with a program to somebody who actually deserves to be called a leader by others. Jim, did you want to yeah, I, I would want to follow Howard's point uh, fairly closely. I think there's a great danger of letting the word crucible become so elastic that it uh, has no meaning left at all. And it's worth going back to Warren's writing, which is a crucible is an event or which transforms your identity. So don't mistake crucible for learning. I mean, those are two, you can learn from many, many different ways. If I believe what Howard wrote, uh, uh, what Warren wrote, rather, and that Howard was working on in his comment, it, the crucible has an identity transforming effect that may often be associated with pain, as Ruth was suggesting, but not always. One of the examples that uh, is in Warren's book is a, uh, a judge who essentially has a good mentor. That's not necessarily painful in the same sense as Franklin Roosevelt's getting polio, which is often a example of the ultimate uh, uh, crucible. And so I think we have to be careful to make sure that crucible is limited to that particular type of experience. But I guess what I believe is that people can have a number of such crucibles. It's not one. And that uh, it, it, we have heard examples, for example, I Georgette's example of her losing her father and then divorce, that strikes me as two major crucibles. And there may be more uh, in a given life in terms of the way it affected your identity. But let's keep Warren's point about it has to affect your identity, not just any form of learning. Thank you, Tal, and then a number of people here. Please. Thank you, uh, Tal Ben-Shahar. Um, two of my mentors are in this room. Uh, one of them is Warren Bennis, and the other one is uh, Richard Hackman. So I'm going to merge the two into one question. And uh, the question that I've been thinking about um, since the conversation started is, what are the conditions uh, that will lead uh, people to experience a transformational um, experience as a result of a, of a crucible? And psychology has a lot to say about this. Um, so we need to ask this question in terms of conditions, both on the individual level and the organizational or um, group level. On the individual level, um, for example, one would be um, to discuss the issue, to discuss the crucible, not to, to repress it. Uh, work by uh, Jamie Pennybaker and uh, work by Laura King show that if we write in our journals or talk to someone uh, about these difficult experiences, uh, we process them, we're much more likely to emerge stronger. The interesting work uh, from uh, Laura King is that the same applies to peak experiences, so to positive experiences, not only to negative um, experiences. Um, another element of, um, another condition that leads to a positive experience is uh, are we able to make meaning of it? So again, Jamie Pennybaker saw that people who got over their crucibles, uh, who emerged stronger, uh, in, in Warren's words, um, were the ones who had a lot of, um, oh, I see, I understand, I realize kind of words in their, in their report. Uh, and finally, and this goes to, to something that Howard said earlier, on the individual level, there are people who allowed themselves to experience the experience. In other words, they gave themselves the permission to be human. They allowed themselves to be vulnerable uh, and to go through the emotion. And this, th this applies to, to grief and to any other crucible, including positive experiences. So that's the individual level. On the organizational group level, so what can we do as leaders to create um, a company, a group, that will most likely help people develop as leaders. Um, and one of the things, of course, there is social support. So a lot of research on resilience uh, by Werner, for instance, uh, shows how people were able to emerge stronger from crucibles if they had, or when they had uh, this uh, social support. And then, of course, the work by Amy Edmondson on psychological safety, again, on the organizational level, given the people the permission uh, to fail, given the people the permission to, to have a second chance. If I could just respond to that for a moment. Um, a tr I, I think that when you go through a truly crucible experience, uh, you go through it alone. I don't think it's so easy um, to go and be able to talk to someone else about it, to, to uh, to your point, to your early point. 
which I think is part of what moves you to, uh, which is part of, 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 of those characteristics that make a, a, a good leader. And that is that you can have that dialogue with yourself. That some of these things you can't, you do go through them alone. It, in fact, it's almost the only way you can get through them is um, the ability to be able to work through them. Um, somehow having a dialogue with yourself and coming out the other end, um, understanding what you've been through and that transformation taking place. But basically, it's a lonely experience. And it's those who have the ability, I think, to be able to do that because in um, true leadership for me, whether it's on a personal level or on a business level, I mean, basically, uh, those final decisions I have to make, or those problems that have to be solved, while I have a fabulous um, team in my company, um, ultimately, when, when that team runs into a wall, um, I have to work through that. And, and I have to work through it primarily alone uh, to, come out to, the, uh, to come out the other end. Jeffrey, and then we have a group back here that wants uh, to ask. Thanks, uh, Ruth. I, I think uh, it's appropriate for, to take a moment for pandering uh, right now. If we uh, think, uh, David, where we, we are at, at roughly 10 o'clock and uh, thinking where the panel's taken us and, frankly, Ruth, where, where you've taken us, uh, yes, we could uh, talk about some questions, Howard, about you know, a lot of uh, uh, divergent paths on the stage and whether or not, Jim, we're, we're making sure we're gleaning the lessons. The thing that strikes me is uh, uh, long overdue compliments to a former student, Ruth. I think the facilitation is extraordinary, and I think what we have accomplished is something quite rare so far. Everybody in this room uh, has been to a lot of leadership seminars and, and given a lot of leadership seminars. Uh, I can't offhand myself think of any which uh, began on such a, a bold theme in a society intoxicated by tips for success that we embrace failure in our beginning and only go into more depth in trying to understand failure. There seems often to be an aversion to, to do what we're doing today. Uh, and it isn't just the, you know, what sells Donald Trump's books versus some of the best sellers in the room, but you, know, you go back to the 1730s to Benjamin Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac, there's none of what we're discussing today or Norman Vincent Peale or Dale Carnegie, uh, uh, is that there's something quite deep happening here and I really applaud the panel for the model they set, but everybody else around the room that's taking us into truly some divergent paths, uh, and we'll never get closure on them today. It's just another one of those caveats, Ruth, that we toss out in the opening, I think, is that hopefully we'll leave here somewhat with more questions than we began, instead of simple answers to paste up on our wall, but there'll be better questions, and the questions, as Linda said, that help guide our learning uh, as leaders rather than the tips how we learn. We have a question out here on just what are the crucibles in uh, it's important to keep in mind that, that Joe's, as we uh, jumped past his quickly, uh, is that you know, people of privilege suffer us just as much as people that without. I uh, thought as something we might uh, scoff at, but folks such as, as Tom Watson of IBM, a junior, very much was haunted by the junior his whole life. Uh, and uh, it, when he first went into IBM, uh, they made sure that he had the, uh, the easiest sales territory in the country. And he, had, he became the number one salesman of the year and was mocked and laughed at. It was a scarring experience for him. If you talk to Steve Forbes today or, or others, you find that sometimes they, the burden of the name they carry. David Rockefeller had always felt that he uh, had to fight being a, a Rockefeller, just like uh, Jimmy Carter, when you talk to him, what it was like as a very privileged, uh, prominent person being fired by the public and what it took to go on to become the nation's greatest ex-president. So what is it, I think, you're right, a lot of different ways of describing what it is. Uh, when it happens, I'm really glad that that question came up. Because your fabulous question, that it isn't just in, as Freud would tell us in youth, we've had all across the age span here, when it happens, and Howard, I think some of your own work has done such a fabulous job about talking about the reframing and the recasting. And as, as Jim brings up uh, uh, Gandhi's name, well, you've studied him along with Mozart and others in terms of how we reframe setbacks throughout life, and I think that's so important to be, I guess you call them the influencers. Uh, but then finally, uh, how do you make meaning out of it, Jim, which is so important is another question we have out there. Uh, and, and Joseph Campbell reminds us that what truly great leaders become heroic 
because of the setbacks, but not all of them make it. Uh, and you're so right, Jim. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, I think, poignant that you should raise the question at a moment of one of Warren's personal moments of crisis, reflection, moment of consciousness in a crucible, uh, ironically back in this town when uh, the dean of the education school here, Paul Ilvesacker, asked you as a university president, but are you happy after a great speech? And then, Warren, you thought about it, you know what? Not so much. And Jim, you threw the ring boy, I believe, to bring him to nirvana, back into the world of, of teaching and real education rather than administrivia. And it was a liberating moment. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's so important as uh, how you learn. When you think of, of great names, who've, uh, people who've rebounded, you make your own list of whether or not it's uh, Mike Nichols or John uh, Irving or, uh, or uh, you know, Robert Altman or people with tremendous setbacks, you find that J.D. Solinger's and the Orson Welles with all the same privilege don't make it back. We look in the media and we see these comeback stories of Jamie Dimond, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of J.P. Morgan Chase or John Mack, uh, or others in the financial world, yeah, people uh, of the same privilege that don't make it back. Carly Fiorina will have a long haul. John Scully, Jack Nasser of Ford, George Fisher of the same privilege, the same intelligence. What are they not learning that the, that the first list is learning? And I think that gets back to tips that we do have floating around. Is there something in the stress literature that's been very misleading that's different than what Linda talked about when you referred to the work of others, but your own early work, Linda, your own dissertation. Uh, I think there's a lot of wisdom and hardiness way before its time on uh, uh, survivors of, of cervical cancer battles and victims struggling, is there's a lot to do with hardiness that has to do with uh, not adapting to stress, which is coping and accepting, but challenging it, essentially a fight and not flight. For all of you who suffered in this room, which is 80% of you, the wisdom most of you got from friends is take your knocks, tomorrow's another day, get on with it, get on with your lives. That's the wrong answer. Yeah. Nick Nicholas going off to a ski slope, after he got uh, and maneuvered out of Time Warner, was the exact wrong thing to do. He needed to engage in battle. And, and that's what those of you who've learned from your experience have accomplished. Rebuilding heroic stature, you have to prove you can still do it. It's, it's not all just an issue of stress, it's an issue of mastery. And uh, there's a lot of ego destruction there, and a different field of psychology ties in there. A third field of behavioral science that's so important on impression management, how others makes sense. People want that capitulation. You know, you may not think Martha delivered it, but to enough audiences, she did. And I think the last uh, one about uh, re uh, rebuilding a, a new mission, it's very important that people do make meaning out of this, almost the ex existential uh, literature that has to be brought in as well, is that there is something that not all, all suffering is redemptive or necessarily noble, but it's how you make sense of it rather than somebody impose the suffering uh, lessons on you. It, that's got to be something from your own experience. But I really uh, applaud the group. If, if the session, at least for me, were to end right now, uh, and I've been studying this area for a while, I've learned so much that I, I could go home after this first session having felt I've gotten a semester worth of material. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. We're not done yet, though. <laughs> Thank you. Two, a couple of th themes that are in the air that I want to make sure that we, that we don't drop and that we, that we explore a little bit, and then I want to get a show of hands who still want, of who still wants to get in on this conversation because I know I had a, a big bunch back here and a big bunch as well. Um, a couple of the themes that are in the air that I, that I don't want us to lose is this, this issue of crucibles that create change in identity and a new sense of meaning and mission versus actually learning to become more effective as as Howard raised, which is a very different issue. It's possible to make cognitive and emotional sense of a trauma in a way that, that makes you see yourself as a leader, gives you a new sense of mission. I think it's an entirely different question to make the kind of behavioral changes that actually make you more effective as a leader. And I'd love, uh, uh, Tal, you raised the question of under what conditions are people able to do that. I'd love to pursue that um, if, if people have thoughts about that as well. And Jeff, you also raised the issue of when it happens and when it doesn't, which brings us to the question of timing. Are there times <coughs> in the life of an individual when they are open and ready and able to change on the basis of these kinds of experiences, um, and are, are there times when the, the system isn't ready? Um, and so, so the whole issue of timing as well. Sorry, Howard, you wanted to get in on this, and then Joe. I probably don't have license to say this, uh, but I, I will anyway. <laughs> uh, and I think it speaks to your question. Uh, I think we are living as a global society right now we are in the midst of perhaps the greatest crucible of all. And um, I think 
when I make that kind of statement, the reason I, I, I say it is I travel internationally about one week out of every eight. And um, I've been all over the world the last few years. And over the last 12 to 18 months, I've never seen a more visceral reaction to the world that we have created. Uh, David, you started out in your comments, which I applaud, by saying you are not in any way being critical of any political party. But the truth is that uh, our leaders have let us down. And I, I can't remember, remember a time, certainly in my own life, I'm 52 years old, when there's such a hunger and such a need for people that we can trust. And if, if there is a crucible event right now, it is the fracturing of trusted leaders. And um, the visceral reaction that I see, for one, is the outrage about American foreign policy. But it's beyond that. It's the hopelessness that we as a macro society have in who is going to create for us, help us create this path out of this. And um, uh, I don't know why uh, leaders have not emerged. Uh, I, I read yesterday in the New York Times, I think we probably all read that, about the, the polls. It's not only about the poll of the president, it's everyone and there's 30 people running for president, but everyone has the lowest poll rating of any individual, probably in, in, in modern American politics, because we don't trust the people who are standing in front of us. And it's on a world stage. And, and I, the, the linkage that I would make to that is that it's, it's not only trusted leaders, it's people who can make an emotional connection with us because there's a deep sense of humanity as part of the conversation. And the crucible event for me and what I observe is, is the lack of humanity in our daily lives. And that is what I think we've lost. In, in a sense, we've lost our soul to the process. And I'm not sure what the process has been or what it is, but everywhere I go and every conversation I'm in, people are saying the same thing. And that is the fracturing of faith in where the world is going. And that is the crucible right how, now of our lives. How, can I ask you a question? Um, I, I, your stats on, on, on Starbucks. Uh, how many stores do you have? 11,000. And how many employees? 140,000. What's the average price of a cup of coffee? Uh, over $3. That doesn't sound like a hopeless society to me. That you could build a company with that many stores, that many employees, and people can afford in this country to spend that much money on a cup of coffee does not sound like a hopeless society to me. That sounds like a pretty optimistic place to live and that we're pretty lucky and that with all the mistakes that we have made and certainly there are crucibles at every level uh, both in government and in our personal lives we have done it pretty well I think we've done a pretty good job of it, basically. If I, I, we can live in a country in which you can build the, com the company that you yeah. built and people can afford to pay that much money for a cup of coffee. Joe, did you want to get I, I don't think I'm up? talking about <laughs> capitalism or money. I'm talking about the human condition. Well, I say the human condition is pretty I, good if that's what... I, I wouldn't if, in if any way use the criteria for what people are buying, willing to pay for a cup of coffee on society. <laughs> well... But you're in a position to do that. Yeah. Uh, I Maybe I could uh, uh, go back to answering Ruth's question and one of Howard's by uh, a concrete example, which is what I would call my real crucible. When I was age 40, I was appointed Deputy Under Secretary of State in the Carter administration and in charge of all nonproliferation policy, which was the biggest foreign policy issue of that time. Uh, up until then, when I went to Washington, I'd been simply a professor, and at most I'd managed one person, my assistant, and most people thought I had the sign wrong on that description. <laughs> and so I was suddenly thrown into this vast bureaucracy with a group, with a set of very radical ideas of what we needed to do to get away from a plutonium economy. And I was a wildly unpopular set of ideas. The only other person who really shared it was the president, but he was busy with other things. 
And so as I was trying to figure out how do I implement this, how do I get progress, get traction on it, uh, I turned to my academic habits. And I would stay in the office till 11 and 12 o'clock at night, get back at 6 a.m. to prepare for my 7 a.m. meeting with the Secretary of State. And after a couple of weeks of this, I thought, you know, I'm drowning. It's like the kid thrown in the pool and you're, you know, in this case, I wasn't going to swim. <laughs> and what's more, uh, we weren't succeeding. We weren't getting any traction. And that actually, that to me was a crucible in the sense that it made me realize that all my academic habits were upside down. They were to turn oh. to myself to go and write hard, read hard, solve the problem. And I said, you know, I can't do this without help. I've got to get others. And that's how I learned the importance of delegation. And I also learned that if you really want power in a bureaucracy like that, you've got to share information. You've got to get others to want to come to you because you're the person that's going to help them figure out where they're going. So it wasn't enough to have a, a good set of ideas about transforming our policy on nuclear energy and use of plutonium and breeder reactors and all those things which we came in with which were unpopular. Uh, it was the ability to get others to buy into that, and you couldn't do that without essentially asking for their help and in turn trading to them things that helped them. And so to Howard's question, which I think was what Ruth yeah. was echoing, yeah. that crucible was the one that made me learn something about leadership. Right. First one, which was a trivial one in a sense, made me learn about myself. Second one made me learn what it is to lead, which is you got to do it with others. But it, and specifically, it was actually something that taught you about how to be more effective, to, right. to sort of drop a set of behavioral habits and acquire a new set that would actually allow you to, to be more capable. So Stephen, I, I just, wanted to, yeah, go I ahead, just please. wanted to add one comment. That yeah. I think most of our leaders today are leading from their ego and leading from their power and leading from their minds. And a crucible event that occurred to me, which was when my wife and I were having marital problems, is that I was an incredible human doer. But she said she just wanted to love my heart, not my doing this. So she really helped to transform me to become a human being and really connect to my heart. So today as a leader, I not only lead with my mind, but, I, but it's connected to my heart and my soul. And I think the, the crucible that our world is facing is that we have leaders that are all ego and there's not enough heart and soul and to see the interconnectedness that, that is occurring um, throughout the world. Thank you, Stephen. We have seven minutes before the break. I want to see who needs to get in on this conversation so that, that we don't lose it. Max, do you want to stand? Ronnie? <laughs> Ronnie. So Max, then Ronnie. I wanted to yeah. follow up on Howard's, I thought, excellent comments. And I think it's great to the CEO of a private sector company who isn't that worried about the price of, of coffee in comparison to, to other issues. I, I think interconnected with this is the failure to learn from critical events that we've seen over the last ha half dozen years. Um, and it's not so much that we're, we've made mistakes. All administrations have made mistakes. What's shocking, I think, is the, uh, in comparison to the stories that we've heard here, is how the current administration in the United States um, has failed to learn from critical moments and has made the same mistakes over and over again. And, and David Gergen emphasizes that this is not a Republican or Democratic group, the Center for Public Leadership. And I don't think anyone's ever accused him of being a left-wing radical Democrat. But he's been very, very uh, effective on TV recently talking about sort of not a political agenda, but an issue of incompetence and, and the failure to, to learn from key events the, the, I, I don't travel as often as you do, but I travel a fair amount overseas, and there's a, just a dramatic difference in the stature of this country around the world um, because of how we've handled so many situations and our belligerence. W.C. Field said, uh, um, if, if, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again, then quit. No use being a damn fool about it. Um, and, 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 and I think that some people just didn't get that last part. Thank you. Ronnie, and then. I uh, so appreciate the intimacy and the, uh, and the reality of, of the conversations and the stories that each of you have shared uh, and the wisdom of the, 
commentary. I also appreciate the conflict between Georgette and Howard that was represented here. I think it's a fabulously important conflict. In, in, in a sense, it's the conflict that we're all thrown into in developing people's capacity for leadership or those of you who are practitioners of leadership doing it, which is how do you both, how do you keep moving in spite of despair? Mm -hmm. And despair, or as you said so eloquently, the fracturing of faith in the future is of course just, as Max would say from his more statistical and analytic background, just a probability estimate. It's just an experience, the experience of despair. And what Georgette described in her life and what you described when you were a little boy were experiences of, de of despair that you somehow moved through. And how to hold people in a sense of faith in a future that they can't yet define because we can't really define the future. But that also connects into the values that are precious and essential from our histories that make it worth undergoing sacrifices for the future. And, and so I, I'd hate to see this be a binary conflict. Are we going to be, are we going to be hopeful or are we going to be despairing? Because in the practice of leadership, you move through those feelings of hope and despair daily if you're really tackling the tough, the tough issues. Absolutely. I, I would just respond uh, by saying that th this isn't an either or question. Uh, we're going down parallel paths and that's the natural order of things. I think the, the issue is not to be a bystander and to recognize that we are living in a very, very critical time. And the question is, in view of your own individual collective responsibility as a leader of a business, as a parent, as a citizen, let's be mindful of the crucible event that we are living in and what can we do about it. I do agree with that, Howard, totally. I, I, as leadership, we, we, have to, we all have a responsibility to step up and uh, do what we can to make it better yeah. and, and, and to not inspire to, our people to, to, to be yeah. responsible. And, and not to blindly ignore it no, or, or, or say it doesn't affect us because we're, we're of the privileged class. That would be a very, very dangerous event. I need to invite some people in the back into yeah. the conversation, please. I view the crucible uh, event, Warren, thank you for bringing us to this point. Oh, thanks. I view the crucible as that moment when the curtain drops, you see the world, and you see yourself in the world and where you are. And then you decide where you want to go and how you want to get there and who you want to take with you. I think that our country is at a moment that we could define as a crucible. I agree with you. We're number one, but it, we have been in the position of being the world leader. But it's, the world is changing. The climate is changing. The weather patterns are changing. The political structures are changing. And you're right. We have very serious leadership problems. So I see that you have seen the curtain drop. <laughs> and clearly, you're seeing the world. And as a group of strong, capable, intelligent, privileged leaders, we have the opportunity as a group to explore that position, our position in the world. And uh, Professor O'Toole, as a person who studies effective organizations, may be able to lend some light on the, how as a nation and how as a group we're going to deal with this crucible experience. Please. <laughs> we'll get to you in a second, Jim. My name's Michelle. Can you hear me? Okay. My name is Michelle Hunt. And... Um, <coughs> Howard, I agree with you. I travel globally every month. And I'm wondering, though, if we are not at a defining moment where instead of looking for the hero to gallop up and save us, that we might be at transitioning to a time, or really transforming, where we need to advocate, teach, and develop personal leadership. Uh, rather than waiting for him or him, a president, a teacher, uh, to do it for us. The I've been real fortunate to have the kind of parents that taught personal responsibility. I do want to share a personal story because I think we're, people are losing hope. I don't think there's a vision of, positive, of a positive future out there. And I know people don't like the word vision, but 
you know, the fact that we don't like the word vision is prob probably speaks very loud about our, our condition. When I was young, I'm 56, so when I was young, we were living in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and we were one of the few African Americans to get housing on a military base. So, you know, every morning when I went out to school, the kids would lock their arms and sing, tick tock, the game is locked, no niggers can play. And I was called nigger 40, 50 times a day, and not just by kids. But my father, every single morning, would get us up, and we'd have to go into the bathroom, and I'd have to stand at the mirror, and he'd be behind me, and I'd have to say, I'm healthy, I'm happy, I'm beautiful, I'm intelligent, I'm loving, I'm loved, and I'm wise. And I thought he was a crackpot. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was a crazy fanatic. <laughs> and, and so what happened is he gave us a positive vision of ourself. I, don't, I, I disagree with you because I do, don't think you go through the crucibles alone. You take that, that kind of vision with you. So when that day came, that in the fifth grade, when the teacher said to me, to me in, the, in the gymnasium, this is your role in front of maybe 100 students, cotton needs a picking so bad, that was supposed to be my role in a play. Um, when she said that to me and asked me to come down and practice that role, I was able, something clicked in. That vision of myself clicked in, and it did not match with the behavior that she wanted me to uh, display. So as I walked down the steps, what clicked in was, I'm healthy, I'm happy, I'm beautiful, I'm intelligent, I'm loving, I'm loved, and I'm wise. And I walked out and went home, and it was that transformative moment. It was a defining moment of my life. It was the most liberating period that I can ever remember. So my whole point in wrapping this up is, and Linda, you talked a little bit about it with the positive uh, psychology. We I, I think it's a time that we have to encourage people to think of what they want to become and what our communities want to become, what our nations want to become. We don't talk about positive futures enough and encourage people to go inside and create that so that you don't get into despair. Despair is from hopelessness. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Bennis, for this opportunity. Um, my question is uh, in large part to uh, Professor Nye. Uh, I appreciate seeing you here today. Um, as I listen to the statements and the comments and the questions, my question has been formulated. Um, part of it grows out of the idea that it's personal crucibles that create leadership. And um, my logic in many ways comes out of my identity as an as a African-American male who grew up in Harlem, New York, um, who probably wasn't supposed to do a lot of the things that he's done, like go to boarding school, graduate from college, and work for a, a, a very successful firm. And I look back at many of my counterparts in Harlem, New York, and I try to figure out, is there a collective crucible that we can create to define leadership for that generation, of, for my generation of, of, of people who traditionally may not have had the opportunity to lead and who are subscribers to a false TV generation of leadership. I open this up to you, Mr. Nye, because I know that government doesn't always respond to, to groups, and sometimes it does, and corporations in creating values of, of people, you know, what types of programs are there? Is, is it a collective possibility, or am I just dreaming? James. Quick, quick answer yes, would be, I think you're You've got an extraordinarily important point. Think back to the way society goes through crucibles. It's not just individuals. Think back of Roosevelt and the Depression. He tried one thing after another. Many of them failed, but they gave people a sense that they were collectively trying to deal with the problem. And it didn't solve the Depression. It was actually World War II that brought the economy back. But Roosevelt brought back hope. 
And he brought back hope by giving people a sense that they were working together to achieve things. Uh, I would argue, and this is not meant to be a partisan uh, comment, but uh, that, uh, that we went through a crucible as a people on 9-11, and we missed an opportunity. In the aftermath of that, we were told to go and shop, in, which was great economics, but <laughs> terrible sociology. And instead of that, what we should have been thinking about, Bob Putnam, who has talked and written about this, the president should have thought of a number of things which could have been the equivalent of the World War II backyard victory garden. Things where each individual could chip in. Things which gave you a sense of collective creation. I think that was a missed opportunity in leadership. And I think what we need to do is when we go through national crucibles of this sort, is for leaders to think of what are the things where we can reinvest in social capital, where we can get a sense of doing things together. And that, I think, is a, I think your point is exactly right. There are opportunities, and we have to look for the right moments to launch them, but it can be done. Thank you. We actually need to take a break, so I'm going to apologize in advance to those of you I, that I did not manage to get to this morning. I'm sure you'll have a chance to join the conversation. Jim, I was going to give you the last word. You wanted Thank to say you. something about Thank one. You. Yes. I think there is uh, one word that we've been using here um, but not really uh, coming to grips with it, and, and that is age and the importance of age. We talked about what a great um, uh, ex-president Jimmy Carter was. We have to remember he was a very, very young president, and most of us believe that um, Bill Clinton would be a much better president today than he was as, as, a, as a much younger man. And, you know, I've noted that when Warren, when I met Warren about 35 years ago, that there weren't a lot of people collected around Warren's feet 35 years ago. Right. He did go through a couple of crucible experiences after that time. <laughs> he was president of the University of Cincinnati, and it was a very painful lesson from him. But he was at a certain age that he was able to make sense of that. And then he had a, a, a very serious life-threatening heart attack. And he was then able to come back and to reinvent himself based upon that. But I believe that it really only happened because of, of the, the age at which it, it occurred. I think it was very important because he had enough experience. He was past the, the, kind of the, the midlife crisis and where most young, young men are all trying to prove themselves with, their, with their, their ego and all the rest of it. And, and he was on the first step to, to uh, developing what is called wisdom. And I think that... Um, as, as Aristotle and Plato pointed out 2,400 years ago, uh, wisdom does not usually come to the young. Right? It takes a tremendous amount uh, of, of life experience to, 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 uh, to, to, to accumulate it. And I think Warren is, a, is a, a living example of this. I think that he, Warren has gotten a hell of a lot smarter in the last 35 years. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and my proof of that is that it wasn't until he was in his seventh decade of life that he finally had the wisdom to marry Dr. Grace Gate. Yeah. <laughs> we will please join me. Please join me in thanking our, our extraordinary stage participants and, and our experts, and also to you as well for a fabulous conversation. Thank you, Thank you all. We'll be reconvening in 15 minutes. Uh, my colleague at Walmart has just written a book about working. Hi, join me. Can everyone take their seats? Ron Heifetz. Can everyone please take their seats? We want to get started. We're about to get started. If everyone could please take their seats. One of the things we wanted to do with this wonderful day, with all of the, the uh, panels, we wanted to also have some fun. And so 
one day we were having a conversation and we got the good news that Stephen Covey was going to be joining us. And I think there's probably not a person in this room has not, who has not read The Seven Habits, Successful People. And Stephen, I must tell you that throughout my career, there's been many times that I have been off balance. And I've thought to myself, I've looked at your book and said, let me look at that, that book. What habits am I off on in The Seven Habits? And so it's such a privilege to have Stephen Covey with us today. He's only here for a short time. So he came in last night, and he has to leave at 12.15 today. So we thought we'd put his, his uh, mind to great use. And on his book, um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, uh, Warren Bennis wrote the endorsement on the original um, copy. And I wanted to read it to you because it really sums up uh, Stephen's work. Stephen Covey has written a remarkable book about the human condition. So elegantly written, so understanding of our embedded concerns, so useful for our organizational and personal lives, that it's going to be my gift to everyone I know. Their gratitude will be shown, I'm convinced, in their work and in their self-worth. Thank you, Warren. Um, just so that you, if you didn't know this, um, the Seven Habits has sold over 15 million in sales and has been in 38 different languages. Stephen has written many other books as well, but obviously is best known for The Seven Habits. But he also started the Franklin Covey Company uh, as co-founder and vice chairman. And I love the mission statement for your company, um, which is very similar to what we're all trying to do in this room, to enable greatness in people and organizations everywhere. And that company has grown to 2,000 associates, providing professional services and products in 39 offices in over 100 countries. But I love this because your office, uh, they, they sent us a few facts about you. And um, he's gotten so many awards, but he, they, his office said, you know, his most valued award, uh, having nine children and 45 grandchildren, um, is his award he got recently, the National Fatherhood of the Year Award, uh, which was given by the National Fatherhood Initiative. And uh, he has, I guess his newest little granddaughter was just born. But Stephen is going to be um, t talking to us the, s the seven habits of Warren Bennis. I give you Stephen Covey. Say, say something about that last award. I was uh, traveling from Montana and uh, switched with my wife on the highway because I was so tired. And then after an hour and a half, she grew tired, pulled over to the side and said, can you take over? I said, yeah, I'm fresh now. That's fine. So I, uh, um, we have a Range Rover. It goes up and down about four inches and she just had a hurt leg. So I said to her, uh, why don't we just switch? I got a bed for you in the back. And she said, yeah, I'll close the door and then lower it down. And then I can climb in easier. And I didn't hear that. All I heard was the door close. So I just took off. <laughs> and we'd just gone to church. She was all dressed up. But she threw her heels in the back of the car ready to climb in. And she was running down the highway like this. <laughs> I was trying to get into 80 mile an hour speeding traffic there on the left, <laughs> like this. And after about 15 minutes, you know, <laughs> policeman calls me on the cell and says, uh, Mr. Covey, yes, sir, this is the highway patrol. Yes, sir. Um, where are you? I said, honestly, sir, I don't know where I am. Let me ask my wife just a second. Sandra, he turned around, where are we? She, no response. Sandra, this is the highway patrol. This is a serious thing. Where are you? He wants to know where we are. And Mr. Covey, Mr. Covey, trust me, she's with me. God. He just had two cell calls that some guy had thrown his wife out on the road. <laughs> some big domestic dispute. And I thought it was kind of funny, so I walked up to him when he at last caught up with us and said, you know, with a horse, when they have one bad leg, you put them down, she's got two. 
you know, he even said to her, isn't it strange he didn't notice you didn't come in the car? Because she thought he was going to sit right here, you know, isn't this strange? <laughs> And from that time on, I've been sleeping at my friends' homes. And <laughs> so I'm really father of the year. <laughs> the guy didn't believe it at all, but he came to. <laughs> well, this is your celebration, Warren, and it is an amazing, amazing experience. And uh, I've done a little research on your habits because you are the total paragon of the seven habits. So we interviewed a few people that know you and work with you well. And the habit one, be proactive, let's put that up. We'll hear the overall diagram. We'll go through each one just very briefly. Be proactive, put up what, uh, is Noel Tishi here? Oh, great. <laughs> Good to see you, Noel. This is what uh, he says. Writing a book with Warren has been a proactive experience. It took a year to get going, so now we have only two years behind. As a duet, we collude with our own victimization. <laughs> Habit two, begin with the end in mind, from John, John Goldsmith. As an advisor to many presidents and presidents-to-be, especially Al Gore, Warren has a habit of advising the man who was elected president but never quite got there. <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, habit three, but first things first. This is what Warren's life is like. Any volunteers? <laughs> yes. I'll do it. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> it's very hard for Warren to, to say no to anything because he's so willing to respond. This is from his daughter, Kate. And uh, habit four, thought four, here's Noel again. When I told the group at the HBR event that my first meeting with Warren in the fall of 1967 at Sunny Buffalo as a senior at Colgate University who drove to meet with Warren, the head of a brand new PhD program in applied behavioral science, that after my interview, he said to me, young man, do not bother applying. I drove dejectedly all the way back to Colgate. Warren told the HBR audience that no, Noel has it wrong. He rejected us. Let me tell you that when you were 22 years old and get rejected by the head of the PhD program you wanted to go to, you remember it. Warren was trying to make it look win-win to the HBR group, but the reality is he rejected me and I will be forever grateful because I got my PhD from Columbia University and Warren's program never got off the ground. <laughs> A true win-win, huh? And here's habit five. If you tell Warren that a play is good, he'll believe it well into the third act, even if it's terrible. Demonstrates his openness in seeking to understand. Habit six, I'll, I'll talk on that because I have nothing to roast him on because he's so good at that. It's seven, we had to delay work. This is again, no on our book once because Warren fell down running in Santa Monica. He's always running too fast, literally and figuratively. So, um, I, that's what I thought. I also thought that his last statement was a little convoluted. <laughs> Now, um, I have just a short vignette, two of them, about 30 seconds each, on Warren and uh, the influence that he has on all of us. This is influencing others and uh, the kind of impact that he has had. Let's show that. Do 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 do
one of the great things that I must say about Warren, he's literally about the most synergistic person I have ever known. I think it comes from an abundance mentality. He is not threatened at all by other people's good luck, successes, and so forth. He genuinely is happy for everybody's success and affirms them so continuously, including writing nice statements like we just read. And uh, that is a marvelous trait, this largeness of soul, this magnanimity of spirit. And this is why you have so many marvelous friends and admirers and students and learners from you. And uh, I just want you to know how grateful we all are for that. This is a continuum that illustrates Warren in my mind. I use it kind of like a communications continuum. How you move from, um, from uh, hostility and defensiveness to respectful communication resulting in compromise and then synergistic communication that results in a third alternative. And that's what I see Warren as representing for all of us. That's transformation, that level. The rest of it is transaction. And that's been my experience with you. That's been Franklin Covey's experience with you. And these people are eating each other up and they're enjoying this experience and benefiting it so much. And to see it, your influence bring us together in this way is a marvelous thing. So everyone in your life is important. Here's one last vignette. that's what we think of you. Everyone here is precious to you. We appreciate and admire you enormously. We love you. Thank you so very much. I don't even know how to follow that. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. It's a privilege to, to have Stephen Covey here. Can the next uh, panelists come up for uh, emo how emotion impacts judgment and decision making? Rod Kramer is our moderator. And uh, it is such a privilege to, uh, to get to know Rod Kramer, who is a professor in behavioral organization at Stanford. I'm going to let you all into a little secret about Rod Kramer. He is one of those people, a scholar and author and professor, who makes us smile at the Kennedy School. And we have been trying to build our ranks of faculty. And we are number one choice. If we could have anyone of all the scholars in the whole country, we at the Center for Public Leadership and the Kennedy School would, would love to have Rod Kramer come and join our team. But he's very happy at Stanford, and his wife is very happy at Stanford. So he comes and he hangs out with us every semester for a little bit of time. Um, so it is just such a pleasure and a privilege to know you, Rod. Uh, just a little bit about him. He's a professor of organizational behavior. Um, he, he's an expert in organizational trust and distrust and influence. He's written several books and over 90 articles. Um, he's a well-known scholar and a friend to our center, Rod Kramer. very much, Betsy. Well, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, it is a tremendous pleasure and honor to be 
part of this uh, wonderful opportunity to celebrate and just participate more in Warren Bennis's extraordinary life. Um, I think all of us are aware of the incredible contributions he's made intellectually to our lives, but also to organizations and, and society. And it's great to participate more in that process. And apropos of our topic today, which is the relationship between emotion and cognition and decision making, I think Warren has affected not only the way we think about the world, the way we understand the world cognitively, but also the way we feel about the world. And that, to me, is one of the extraordinary things about even being in his presence, which I, I was reminded of last night at the uh, cocktail party, that Warren has a way of listening to you and touching you that makes you feel incredibly smart, incredibly liked, and incredibly safe all at the same time. It's such a, a wonderful uh, moment to be with him. Um, Without further ado, I'd like to introduce the distinguished panelist, um, and I'll start with Max Bazerman uh, on, on my most extreme right. Uh, Max Bazerman is the Jesse Isidore Strauss Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School. He also is affiliated with the Kennedy School of Government and makes many contributions there. In his prior position at the Kellogg School of Management, Max was the founder and creator and director of the Kellogg Environmental Research Center. Max's research focuses on decision making and negotiation and also improving decision making in organizations, nations, and society. He is the author and co author of a dozen books and over 150 scholarly articles, and it's a real pleasure to have him uh, here. Uh, next, uh, I'll introduce Ken Blanchard, is the co chairman and the spiritual. Uh, Chief Spiritual Officer of the Ken Blanchard Companies, an international management, training, and consulting firm that he and his wife Margie founded in 1979. A much sought after author, speaker, and business consultant, Dr. Blanchard is universally recognized by his friends, colleagues, and clients as one of the most insightful, powerful, and compassionate people in business today. And he is the author of numerous successful books, but I suspect all of us are familiar with The One Minute Manager. And as a parent, I love to remark about The One Minute Son. Uh, uh, Margie Blanchard is the co-chairman of the Ken Blanchard Companies. She is also heading a unique experiment they're doing called the Office of the Future, which is a think tank charged with shaping the future of the, both the training industry but also uh, companies. Uh, Dr. Blanchard has earned a reputation worldwide as a compelling motivational speaker, and I think we'll see that today, an accomplished management consultant and trainer, and a best-selling author as well, and an entrepreneur. Uh, uh, Warren Earhart, uh, great pleasure to see you, has for the past 35 years, as we all know, has been the creator of innovative ideas and models of individual organization and social transformation, uh, and is also an electric public speaker. While he may be best known for many of the ap specific applications of his ideas, the models themselves have been the source of new perspectives by thinkers and practitioners in the field not only of business and government, but also philosophy, uh, conflict resolution and community building. Uh, Stephen Covey, uh, I guess I shouldn't reintroduce you, but what a pleasure it is to have you here. And uh, Noel Titchy, who's already gotten his shot in, uh, is professor, of course, of organizational behavior and human resource management at the Distinguished University of Michigan Business School at Michigan. He is also the director of the Global Business Partnership, an international consortium joined to develop senior executives and conduct uh, action research on globalization. Uh, he now heads up their global leadership in healthcare program. He's a prolific and distinguished author of many books that we've all enjoyed over the years, including uh, The Leadership Engine. We also, ladies and gentlemen, have some really distinguished expert uh, contributors in the audience as well. Uh, and I'll start with uh, Ron. Dr. Uh, Ron uh, Desarowitz is the chairman, CEO, and president of FHC Health Systems, a privately owned company founded in 1983, uh, specializing in the management and delivery of behavioral health care systems sir, and the information systems that support them as well. Uh, the largest of FHC's business units, Value Options, is one of the nation's leading providers of managed behavioral health care programs serving commercial and public sector clients, uh, offering services up to two, 22 million people in the world. Uh, Susan Fowler, where is Susan? Susan, uh, good to see you here, is the consulting partner of the 
uh, Ken Blanchard Companies and co-founder of Leadership Legacies. Uh, she is the creator and lead developer of Situational Self-Leadership, uh, which is one of the best of class self-leadership and personal empowerment programs in the world today. She is widely known to be one of the foremost experts on personal empowerment in the world today. Uh, and Barbara Kellerman, I saw earlier, Barbara, it's great to see you here, uh, is a uh, research director of the Center for Public Leadership and lecturer in public policy at the Kennedy School of Government. She's also a great personal friend. Uh, she previously served as the center's director. Barbara is the author and editor of numerous influential books and articles, the most recent being, I think, a very courageous book on bad leadership, uh, what it is, how it uh, happens, and why it matters. Uh, Drea Sigarmi is a founding associate of the uh, Ken Blanchard Companies. Where is Drea? Yes, thank you. Uh, and also the founding partner of Leadership Legacies uh, and the president of Sigarmi Associates Incorporated. He has more than 25 years of experience training, teaching, speaking, and consulting in a global context. Uh, throughout the morning's preparations, uh, David Gergen and the other advisors emphasized informality. So in the spirit of informality, I'm now going to take off my coat in a very dramatic fashion, uh, which is supposed to stimulate other people to undress as well. <laughs> Given the formality of the occasion, however, I did want to get credit for bringing the coat, David, so that's why. That's why I waited to take it off. Um, our format, ladies and gentlemen, will remain uh, as informal and conversational as possible. And so I've switched to a hand mic to try to move as much as possible throughout the audience. But please be quite aggressive and assertive, as the panelists on the stage will be, about uh, asserting themselves and, and getting their point of view across. I would like to say on a personal note, since I'm a psychologist who studies emotion and judgment and decision making, to me this is a particularly exciting and timely panel for our group. Uh, and I even brought a little prop today, quite literally a little prop. Uh, this is not a full-scale brain, uh, done to scale. Uh, but, you know, if you were like me, going through high school and college, when they taught you about the human brain, they always described the emotions as part of the primitive brain, the old brain, the prehistoric brain, and the emotions were bad. And what made us wonderful and human and successful was the the new brain, the frontal cortex, the more developed brain, that made us rational and smart and so forth. And that helped us get into Harvard and all the places we've gotten into in life. Well, now we know that that simple model of the brain is just completely wrong. That, in fact, these emotional pathways and cognitive pathways are much more interdependent in a rich and generative way than, in fact, make, makes us much more interesting and adaptive uh, creatures. By the way, I brought a bigger brain for those of you who are farther back. This, this one is not in quite as good a condition. It's, it's had a rough life. But uh, I would like to think about today's activities before the morning, after the morning. By the time we leave today and get exposed to all of Warren's ideas, this will be our new brain. So without uh, further ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me start perhaps with Max, who had a story he wanted to tell about the impact Warren has had on his life. I was uh, jealous by the excellent topic that the first group had, and, and, and the stories were just compelling. And um, uh, sort of on, on the topic of, of, of judgment, emotion, and decision making, um, I, I thought back to sort of a critical moment in, in, in my career. Um, while I grew up in a family that was not well off, it was, it was just taken as a foregone conclusion I would go to college. But as the first person who ever was sent off to college, I, I was sent to do something practical. So my critical disadvantage in life was as a freshman at the University of Pennsylvania, I was an accounting major, which is a sort of intellectual deprivation. Um, <laughs> and uh, that summer, I spent back in my hometown of Pittsburgh. Um, and for a variety of quirky reasons, I ended up taking a course which was essentially a uh, reading a book a week under the supervision of Howard Gardner's brother-in-law, Lenny Sachs, and talking about it over dinner. And the uh, first book I read was uh, The Social Animal by Elliot Aronson, which the psychologists in the room would know. And then the second book that Lenny told me to read um, was The Temporary Society. And, um, and I read it with fascination. And by the time I went back to the University of Pennsylvania um, for my second year, I was too practical to give up this business stuff. Um, and so I finished with an accounting major, but 
clearly I had gone through a trans uh, critical moment, a crucible moment, in terms of saying, I don't really want to be an accountant. So I, it, it was a critical moment in terms of the shift in my career. But the content of the book is also kind of fascinating in seeing the evolution of the study of decision making. Um, could, uh, with, with the influence of, of Herb Simon and Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky, th there's a field of decision making research that's become very, very prominent. And I would say the field has generally talked about how we misprocess information that we have available. Um, and uh, more recently, a number of, uh, uh, a number of people, uh, including my own work on predictable surprises, focuses on how leaders could miss even seeing critical problems and avoid uh, dealing with those problems. Um, recently, I only met um, uh, Warren about a year ago, and recently I reread Temporary Society. And it's uh, quite amazing to take a look at that book because we're now back where Warren was decades ago, where we're focusing on what can we identify as leaders that are critical changes that are going to confront us. And in temporary society, um, Warren did a great job of n not playing futurist, of making 32 predictions and then claiming credit for the six that turned out to be right, <laughs> but actually thinking about what does the data tell us about what we could anticipate. And now scholars are moving in that direction. And I would say that our leaders are doing a lousy job of moving in that direction, that there are lots of problems that we should see coming and we should act on before um, bad events occur. There are, there are opportunities that we should seize um, much earlier. David mentioned um, the fact that Katrina took us by surprise. That shouldn't have been the case. Um, airline security was a problem long before 9-11. Um, auditor independence was and continues to be a problem um, long before Enron and the host of other scandals occurred. And I see temporary society as a role model for what I think leaders should be doing beyond processing information, right? But actually identifying what are the issues that are too easy to ignore, both for cognitive reasons but also emotional reasons, and the failure to act on these foreseeable events is creating devastation both in our country and throughout the world. So um, I. For those of you who haven't read Temporary Society for a while, go read it again. Thank you, Max. And, and thanks for making that uh, lovely connection between personal and inle intellectual influence. In a way, it perfectly sets up the videotape we've prepared where Warren is going to make some remarks about the relationship between emotions, judgment, and leadership. What is at the very center of leadership? What is the single marker of good or bad leadership is judgments? judgment calls. That's the heart of the matter. It's the fundament. It's the nucleus of what leadership is all about. Daniel Kahneman, who did win the Nobel Prize for his work on judgment and decision making, uh, emphasized how often and erratic our decisions are because we don't take into account those, quote, irrational things called emotions. Um, without folding that in without feathering that into our studies of judgment and decision making we will never have a complete understanding of judgment. With all due respect to all the leadership gurus in the audience tonight, Shakespeare has got us all beat. You know, I mean if John Kerry had ever listened to Falstaff who was the executive coach for Prince Hal, he said if you want to lead people you got to enter their world. If you want to lead people, doesn't mean you have to come out of that world. You have to be in that world. You have to have the touch for that world. I mean, I keep using Caesar as a good example. This brilliant man, how did he miss so much? You know, so, this, so we have to augment what we do in, from science. And I think we're getting some really promising areas of the neurosciences of emotion. Let's take a look at um, um, how oriented the New York Times, who seemed to be totally oblivious to what was going on with it, his, quote, direct reports. I mean, uh, he was warned, just like Caesar was warned. He was even warned better than Caesar. There was an 18,000-word article about his leadership in the New Yorker magazine by Ken Oletta, which at, described in um, kind of breathtaking detail the problems that Howell Range was having. Yet, a year later, when some of this stuff came out in a public meeting, Howell seemed utterly surprised. 
So really? They think I'm humiliating? They think I play favorites? They think I should have gone down to the news? It was all in print. If he had only spent a half hour every day being sensitive to those people who are just one floor below him in the newsroom, I mean, he would still be in office and thriving today. What a lack. So we talk about self-intelligence, we talk about so how one affects and, and understands the social network, and we talk about contextual intelligence. Uh, what is it that the person reads or doesn't read about the culture, this history, the, this uh, a Carly Fiorina, whom I was rooting for, and it seemed to me that um, she missed a fundamental aspect of any organizational change agent, which is not to adhere to the symbols of tradition and the past simultaneously look to inventing the future. And that's a hard row for anyone to navigate. And we're, I think, giving some, I know giving some important clues to all these forms of intelligence. Think of it almost, uh, and I'm going to make an analogy to the heart. The problems with most bad decisions is that the information pipeline that is relevant and meaningful data are not getting to the right people at the right times. This is very like getting the rich oxygenated blood into the heart and getting it there properly without any arrhythmia, without any clogs. And when we've looked at enough bad judgments, almost always there's some rupture, some fracture in the information pipeline. I thought it would be nice to begin with uh, talking to Warren, uh, Werner about um, uh, your observations about the role the emotions play in the kinds of dramatic transformations, especially personal transformations that you've studied and advocated uh, and, and thought about so much. Well, I've looked at emotion from two ends of the spectrum. The um, ones that seem to be stuck there and come up from time to time. And at the other end of the spectrum, I've been studying with a group of actors for the last three or four years how to call forth an emotion. And um, with regard to leadership,